personally, if you were to be diagnosed with some form of cancer, how would you treat yourself personally? Would you use the standard of care with chemotherapy, um, depending on what cancer it is? And, and how would you alter your lifestyle and your diet? It's a bit of a loaded question, but I know. I will, sorry, uh, <laughs> no, I'm I'm glad. I guess I get asked this question a lot. Uh, it really comes down to the type of cancer. Like okay. I know, uh, friends and colleagues of mine kind of feel that cancer is sort of you know all one disease, and I think there's a lot of truth to that. Uh, but also understand that you know I I have people that are close to me that have cancers for example leukemia mm -hmm. acute myeloid leukemia as an example uh i know people with multiple myeloma uh lymphoma uh testicular cancer had one or two or three students or three people that i know uh responded very well to the standard of care um, and some of them did the ketogenic diet some didn't so it really depends on the type type of cancer. We mm -hmm. I got into this looking at brain cancer. So it mm. made sense to me because I realized, oh, brain cancer patients have seizures and they're on heavy doses of anti-seizure drugs sometimes, but they're also put on something called dexamethasone, which is a corticosteroid that really disrupts your metabolism and elevates your glucose in a way that's feeding the cancer. Uh, these corticosteroids do. So I thought the ketogenic diet could be used for that. And then the more I started looking into it, I saw that Thomas Seyfried had published that a calorie-restricted ketogenic diet targeted tumor metabolism in a way that was highly efficacious, at least in animal models. So, uh, so it really, I'm just saying this because it really depends on the type of cancers. Uh, a couple of reviews have been written about the types of cancers. So, uh, things that are really metabolically demanding cancers and these are cancers that would show up on a, a PET scan and mm -hmm. FGG PET scan so if someone has a type of tumor a solid tumor in particular that's really hot on a PET scan and mm -hmm. that means that it's sucking up massive amounts of glucose relative to the healthy tissue surrounding it so what a ketogenic strategy does and it could be used as an adjuvant to the standard of care uh, is that it's lowers glucose availability to the tumor and most mm -hmm. tumors really have accelerated glucose metabolism and that's driven in part by uh, insulin and insulin signaling like uh, IGF-1. Uh, the PI3 kinase AKT mTOR pathway, I don't want to go down that road, but <laughs> it's activated, it's driven by glucose insulin and the insulin sort of pathway right mm -hmm. so if we suppress the hormone insulin we can do that with nutritional ketosis especially if it's calorie restricted that basically is knocking down a major driver of most cancers like I, it's it's pretty safe to say that i would say 80 percent or more cancers are really driven by this pi3 kinase akt mtor pathway when these pathways are hyperactivated and insulin being a driver for that uh, it accelerates cancer growth and proliferation so one mm. way to take the foot off the gas gas pedal of this cancer growth and proliferation is to knock down the prime one of the main pathways accelerating it uh, which is which is insulin and how do we knock down insulin through carbohydrate restriction and to some extent protein restriction also fasting intermittent fasting where we go through periods of time restricted eating so if we were to do this prior to the standard of care like chemotherapy or radiation it makes the tumors more vulnerable to uh modalities that kill through what we call an oxidative stress mechanism so if you limit glucose availability to a tumor and if you're in a fasted state uh, the tumor's ability to create its own antioxidants glutathione being a major one is is a bit impaired mm. so uh, you can enhance the cancer killing effects of chemo and radiation uh, if if the patient is in a a fasted state or on a ketogenic diet. We also think that hyperbaric oxygen therapy, mm. which increases the partial pressure of oxygen in the tissues and thereby also enhances uh, oxidative stress. And the oxidative stress is higher in cancer cells because of the aberrant mitochondria that they have. They spit out more of something called superoxide in response to increasing 
uh, levels of oxygen relative to normal cells. So you'll have enhanced oxidative stress in cancer cells, also more free heme. And when you, it creates, it drives something called the Fenton reaction. You yeah. don't need to know that, but listeners may be familiar with these pathways, but it creates a scenario where uh, oxidative stress is higher just by using something that's relatively non-toxic, like hyperbaric oxygen therapy within defined limits. And then if you give uh, radiation or chemo, that could enhance uh, the efficacy of that, especially in the context of a ketogenic diet. So radiation and chemo could essentially boost the effects of hyperbaric treatment? Yeah, well, the efficacy of radiation is proportional to the PO2 of the tumor, right? So okay. if you radiate a tumor that's mm -hmm. hypoxic, the radiation killing effect of the tumor will be dependent on molecular oxygen that's inside the tumor. So if you hyperoxygenate a tumor <clears throat> or if you reverse tumor hypoxia, because a lot of tumors, they grow so fast, it outstrips their ability. The, the vascular church can't keep up with the expanding biomass. <clears throat> right. So the the inside of the tumor, the core of the tumor becomes anoxic or hypoxic. Mm -hmm. But if you, with hyperbaric oxygen, the oxygen is transferred uh, to the tumor, not by blood vessels, but it's in plasma. Hemoglobin's mm -hmm. already saturated. So it gets oxygen to the plasma and then <clears throat> you hyperoxygenate the tumor, reverse the tumor hypoxia, and then apply the, uh, the stimulus. Uh, the killing stimulus. So that could be chemotherapy. It could be radiation. It could be an immune-based drug too. Wow. We call this the press pulse theory. So if you Google like press pulse theory and a publication, nutrition mm -hmm. metabolism, this idea that you create a stress on the cancer cells by nutritional ketosis, drugs like metformin, intermittent fasting, exercise, meditation, things like that creates an environment that compromises the tumor's ability to grow or decreases its ability to grow. Uh, being in a fasted state will also make the tumor more vulnerable by weakening its antioxidant defenses and, and also suppressing certain growth pathways, that PI3 okay. kinase pathway. <clears throat> and then... Uh, and then other modalities will work better. So that could be uh, hyperbaric oxygen therapy could be used, but chemo, radiation, and immune-based therapies too uh, will be more efficacious in the context of a press. So a press and then a pulse therapy can be delivered ideally like two or three weeks on, you know, three weeks off, something like that. It depends on the particular agents, but there's also metabolic drugs that can be used too. And some of these drugs are toxic, like 2-deoxyglucose, 3-bromopyruvate, lonidamine. These are things that target the, sh the glycolytic pathways. Okay. Uh, and we use these sort of these things experimentally. Uh, but I think what patients who are listening maybe can go and look up the press pulse concept. And we just basically put a paper out as a concept. Here's an idea. Uh, we are working with different people that are moving this into the clinic. And some people are just doing it because right now there's no, not a whole lot of clinical trials that are incorporating this. Mm -hmm. Uh, although I have to say that when I started studying this, the ketogenic diet, there was maybe two clinical trials, and now I looked this morning before coming. There was thirty-nine clinical trials. What? Uh, yeah, and about many of them are ongoing or recruiting too. So wow. So now these are you know many of them, a lot of them are top tier institutes like doing things. And then I looked up fasting. I had never like went on to clinicaltrials.gov and put in cancer and then fasting, and like hundreds of trials came up. Not all of them are relevant, but there was dozens of trials looking at the effects of fasting before chemo and radiation. Hmm. Many, the first like couple were using the fasting mimicking diet. So Walter Longo, who's on the West Coast, developed a diet that's essentially used five days per month. And it's a hypocaloric diet that puts the body into a state of ketosis, mild uh, ketosis. And, and this type of diet can be used in conjunction with a standard of care. And it's, a, it's, it's sort of a commercialized version of a ketogenic diet, and it's mostly plant-based. So it has some unique aspects to it. Uh, one could formulate their own ketogenic diet or their own fasting mimicking diet just by going to the grocery store and, and formulating the foods. Right. So, uh, so the science is, is really ongoing and it's emerging, but they have dozens of registered clinical trials looking at the effects of fasting uh, mm -hmm. and cancer as a means to enhance uh, standard of care. Mm -hmm. 
And and patients should also, if they're interested in in being part of these clinical trials, clinicaltrials.gov. That's the basically the site that has registered clinical trials. So look up ketogenic diet and then your whatever cancer you have, whether it be lung cancer, endometrial cancer, liver cancer, something like that. Right. So look up to see if maybe a clinical trial is in your area and you might be, um, you know, might be able to participate in that. When they talk about the hyperbaric oxygen treatment, do they use those like tube things that like LeBron James gets into after his basketball games where he lays down and like, it's kind of like a coffin shaped tube. Yeah. Uh, is that what they use? Well, or? that that would be uh, that's a monoplace chamber. Okay. And yeah, so that that could be one of uh, ways. There's also a multi-place chamber that you could use. Mm-hmm. But if you go to a hyperbaric oxygen clinic, what they may do is uh, most of these clinics actually there. There's 14 different FDA approved applications for hyperbaric oxygen therapy. Oh, really? Uh, one is decompression sickness. If you're a diver, you know, you come up with the bends, you go inside a hyperbaric chamber. Uh, the other is for i mean there's there's a lot but the top ones would be uh diabetic wounds so wounds people who have diabetes their blood is like sludge so they're not getting enough oxygen and nutrition to the wound so it begins to fester and mm-hmm. grow and hyperbaric oxygen therapy hyper oxygenates the wound a wound is hypoxic and the energy levels in that tissue are knocked down by like 90 percent so hyperbaric oxygen therapy can restore metabolism. And we also believe if you put someone on a ketone supplement or, and one of my students, Dr. Shannon Kessel did her PhD dissertation on the effects of nutritional ketosis and wound healing. And it's remarkably effective at enhancing the wound healing process. Wow. Uh, and we think if you couple it with hyperbaric oxygen, it would be, you know, diabetic wounds or chronic wounds. It's like a multi, multi-billion dollar health problem right now that people have typically with type two diabetes, but people have bed sores, right? Like these wounds, they don't heal. Uh, nutritional ketosis is one. So hyperbaric oxygen is used for that. Mm-hmm. So you have multi-place chambers. You can get in, you go in, you read a book, you listen to music. Sometimes the walls of the chamber are transparent so you can see what's going on in the room. And then you have a multi-place chamber where you get inside the chamber. It's pressurized to like say two or 2.5 atmospheres at hyperbaric air and then you put the mask on and that's 100 mm. percent oxygen and you breathe that mask and then you reach hyperbaric oxygen therapy levels you take the mask off so if you have a seizure you could take the mask off and then you go from hyperbaric oxygen to hyperbaric air which the partial pressure of P- the po2 uh, will be low enough that you won't have a seizure does okay. that make sense? Yeah, that okay. makes sense. So we're breathing 20% oxygen now, a hyperbaric oxygen chamber. You're breathing in a monoplace chamber. You're breathing 100% oxygen typically or, or thereabouts. And when you get inside a multi-place chamber, it's 20% oxygen, but you put the mask on, mm. that becomes 100% oxygen. And hemoglobin is already saturated, right? But the oxygen gets into the plasma. And that's the benefit to wound healing. Oh, okay. That's the benefit to attacking a tumor is that tumor vasculature is like erratic and not very good so the tumor becomes hypoxic but if it's in the plasma it can penetrate that tumor oh wow and then oxygen can kick on reactive oxygen species that can start to kill the tumor inside out and then you apply most chemotherapeutic drugs kill cancer cells through an oxidative stress mechanism so if you've already you know caused oxidative stress and you apply uh, oxyplatin or cisplatin or something like that uh and then radiation too uh, then you have like it, it creates a lot more die off in the tumor. If okay. You do that. And then being in ketosis will protect your healthy cells and also sensitize the tumor cells to more. So that was sort of, you know, some of the first publications okay. that we did and okay. people are following up on that. Wow, it's amazing how many more studies have come out on how many how do you mean the cl- clinical yeah. trials you were saying that they're doing? Yeah, the clinical trials is really yeah, it's amazing. You know, we're not doing any uh, because mm-hmm. we're more of a basic science. But people look at the research that we're doing mm-hmm. and they say, hey, you know, just some people give us a heads up and it's like, you know, mm-hmm. your your research kind of inspired this clinical uh, trial. Other people were doing this research too. Dr. Thomas Seyfried was a huge pioneer, mm-hmm. and I just followed in his footsteps and just used his model system. Uh, uh, Lou Cantley is doing some work with the ketogenic diet and targeting this PI3 kinase uh, pathway with different drugs. Uh, Dr. Adrian Sheck, uh, she was at Barrow Neurological Institute, is really a pioneer in glioblastoma, which is the 
a deadly form of brain cancer. And her work has inspired, you know, the Barrow Neurological Institute and the lead clinician there, Chris Smith, to sort of advocate that patients with glioblastoma, glioblastoma follow the ketogenic diet prior to them coming in and having surgery because it helps shrink the tumor and makes wow. it a smaller target that they can resect it and they get better outcomes, you know, after, after surgery too. So I've been communicating with some of those patients. 